Excellent. Hello and welcome. People are starting to arrive. We'll give you a few minutes to get to get in. So I think that's people in. So welcome to today's uh, Southwest Marine Ecosystems webinar, um, which Keith Hiscock will be giving us. Um, just a little bit of information. This is the first one of these that uh, we at the MBA are um, are hosting for you. So it's a real pleasure to be able to do this today. Um, we're going to be hosting another couple of them, uh, the Fish and Reptiles one on the 29th of March and the Marine and Coastal Birds webinar. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for some of those as well. Um, we are also just going to give you a little bit of information about the MBA while we're here before I pass over to Keith. So we've actually got some other events coming up over the, uh, the coming months and weeks that you might be interested in. So depending on who's watching today, um, for any of you that are postgraduate study level, then our postgraduate conference is fast approaching on the 12th and uh, to 14th of April. That's up in Aberystwyth um, and tickets are still for sale for that. Um, so check that out. It's a really great um, community to be able to present your postgrad research in a sort of nurturing environment. Um, so we've got that coming up and then we've got some skills courses happening. We've got a marine fish ID course in June, um, boat based uh, marine ecological survey skills uh, towards the end of July. Um, we've got an introduction to plankton course in October and then we've also got and this is probably a little specialized, but we've got the, the 38th micro electride techniques for cell physiology workshop at the beginning of uh, September. So if any of those are of interest to you, um, you can get all the details on the MBA website, mba.ac.uk. Um, and we'll maybe put some links in the chat as we go. Also, for those of you that are not familiar with the MBA, we are a membership organization. We are the voice of marine biology. Um, and so if you're not yet a member um, and you would like to be, then again, you can find information on our website, join us, become part of the community um, and benefit from some of the amazing, uh, the amazing things that that brings with it, including the Marine Biologist magazine. So down to today's webinar, a um, couple of little housekeeping things. This is being recorded. So, um, and that recording will be shared on the Southwest Marine Ecosystems um, YouTube channel um, at some point in the future when that gets up there. So if when we get to the end and we get to questions, if you don't want your voice to appear on the recording, please don't uh, unmute yourself and speak. Um, we are going to leave all the questions to the end and those can go in the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we can read those out and Keith can answer them. Or if you would like to ask them yourself, then you can use the raise your hand icon and we can invite you to unmute and that will all happen at the end. Um, the chat is also down the bottom of your screen. And um, if you've got any comments or um, any information that you think Keith would be interested in, you can pop that in there um, and you can just chat to each other in there as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Keith who is going to give today's webinar. There you go, Keith, over to you. Uh, thank you, Cathy, um, for that very good introduction. Uh, you should by now be seeing the um, uh, introductory slide. Uh, Perfect. For this show. You've got it, have you? We've got it, we can see it. Yeah, there Looks we are. Great. So thank you very much indeed to the Marine Biological Association for hosting um, this webinar. I think you'll all be aware that the MBA has a very long and continuing history of um, collecting and disseminating data on uh, marine life. Um, and that continues. I'll mention that at the end as well. Uh, I think just to mention that shore and seabed observations tend to be very opportunistic and descriptive. So I've got very few impressive statistics or histograms or graphs in this presentation. Um, but I think a lot of what we're doing carries on that tradition of uh, curiosity based uh, citizen science type uh, recording, and it does tell a story. So let's get on with it. So 
marine life highlights and lowlights in 2022. Now, this is your chance to comment on what were the highlights and lowlights and add your significant records uh, to the report, which I'll be preparing on the state of Southwest Marine Ecosystems in 2022. Uh, by now, I hope you'll have signed up uh, to be kept in touch. Um, if you want to look at webinars which have already happened, or if you want to watch this webinar again when it is installed on the website, just go on to the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website and click that button um, and you'll get through to um, the YouTube channel. And for you, a question. So where a change occurs, what, if anything, does it tell us about the state of the Southwest Seas? Um, this is a challenge because, you know, we do want to convert the sort of information that we're collecting into something which can advise government, statutory authorities on where things are going right, where they're going wrong, uh, how to interpret, for instance, things like uh, press releases and so on. So there we are, that's what we're about. And the presentation, uh, these are the topics that I'm going to cover. Uh, you can read them yourself, but hopefully they'll uh, uh, be flow quite nicely. So I wanted to start, first of all, with um, a favourite place of mine, Lundy. Uh, as you know, I've been going to Lundy uh, doing marine biological work since 1969. Yes, I am that old. And... Um, but I had very little to do with organising this particular successful event, the Lundy Marine Festival, which celebrated 50 years of marine conservation at Lundy. It was Robert Irving who did all the hard slog and he did a very good job. We had intertidal and subtidal inventory surveys, condition assessments, uh, shellfish surveys. The Darwin Tree of Life uh, team were over there sampling and we looked at non-native species, uh, especially on Lundy. So those are just some um, pen thumbnail pictures. The Porcupine Marine Natural History Society BioBlitz uh, was part of the London Marine Festival. And you can see there that by the end of uh, the work, which was done both in the intertidal and the subtidal, uh, we had 478 species listed. Uh, the Porcupine Marine Natural History Society uh, meeting is this weekend in Bangor, uh, and John Moore and his colleagues will be giving much more information uh, we uh, set up a pop-up laboratory in the St. Helens Centre, which is uh, the church, uh, restored recently with a heritage uh, grant, a heritage lottery grant, um, and that was a very successful um, event. Um, took the opportunity to spend some of the money from the Blue Marine Foundation to look at whether the, the no-take zone was working, and what uh, the people involved in that survey found was that the number of lobsters caught within the no-take zone was higher by a factor of 6.6 .6 compared with outside of the no-take zone. So from the point of view of commercial species, the no-take zone continues to work and they were larger overall. I was roped in to uh, take uh, quantitative photographs of the nationally rare sunset cup coral populations, which were first discovered in Britain at Lundy, and there'll be more of that in the next slide. Now, this is a very interesting detective story because the numbers of sunset cup corals, as I say, nationally rare species, have been dropping since the mid 1980s. Now, at the main monitoring site, they're about one third the numbers of individuals that they were in the mid 1980s. And Robert Irving has been busy um, comparing the quantitative photographic surveys which have been done <coughs> over the years. So here's an example. It's only an example. Uh, Robert's, I think, just about finished his report. Uh, that will be available at the Porcupine meeting and then it will be available online uh, free of charge. But this gives you an idea that 2010, and 2022. So 12 years apart, this was a, quite a poor photograph, but Robert had overlaid an acetate and given the cup corals numbers. And you can see that 12 years later, more or less exactly the same corals are there with the same numbers. N stands for new, that's new compared with 2010. This number 80 has disappeared but there's a great deal of persistence in these corals, even though in the Mediterranean, they're thought to be 
uh, only living for about 13 years. Well, we're 12 years now and they're, they're still there. So that's that's my one of my key conclusions. Robert will have others. But what he's saying is that, that there has been a decline in the number of Sunset Cup corals, a worrying decline. But there's an increase in the number of juveniles appearing, which may indicate the doom scenario is beginning to change. So keep that in your head. Identifying change and interpreting change um, is, is very important. Actually understanding why the change is occurring is an entirely different matter. If you've got any ideas, let me know. We, during the um, collecting activities uh, and particularly the Darwin Tree of Life uh, activities, we found two more non-native species at Lundy. Uh, there are 12 already known from Lundy. Uh, and these are the two which uh, we found in addition. But we looked for and did not find any more Pacific oysters. Five had turned up in 2021, were promptly bashed, and uh, we hope that that's an end to it, but I suspect that it's not. So, yes, there are non native species on Lundy, and in the landing bay, some of them are dominant. For instance, it was only in 2021 that we found uh, this very aggressive non-native species, uh, Red Ripple Bryozoan Water Cypone uh, Sabatra. And it spread enormously since 2021 into 2022. This is the entrance to um, a small cave where I've got a monitoring transect. You can see it there at the top of the picture. And it's now coating a great deal of the rock. So water cypora is, as I say, an aggressive species, which normally lives in fairly dark habitats under overhangs, in caves, under boulders and so on. But we'll come back to it a bit later. And then coming back to Lundy, but first of all, a picture of the Edderstone Reef, where the pink sea fan populations have been very, very, very healthy for many years, even after the 2013-14 storms. They were there in the normal numbers, in very large numbers, um, and in very healthy condition. So this is the Edison Reef on the 3rd of July 2022. Lundy and indeed Scoma across the water is a different story. Of course there was the disease event in uh, the early 2000s which killed a great many pink sea fans at Lundy. Some of those dead pink sea fans are still there att attached to the rock and covered in fouling and also the bull husk tend to like to attach their eggs to them. So in the surveys which we did, looking at the condition and abundance of pink sea fans, we were also finding a lot of ones which were dead and not looking very healthy at all, of course. Um, but there was some recovery, uh, healthy pink sea fans, no more disease, although the bull huss eggs are still attached to many of them. Um, but very low recruitment, not the sort of abundance that we used to see at Lundy. I do wonder if the individuals which are there are too far apart for sperm and eggs to meet. So pink sea fans, male and females, produce eggs and sperm into the water column. Those eggs and sperm need to meet to make planulae larvae, um, which will settle and grow into new pink sea fans. Tell me what you think. Um, there's been a terrific amount of work in 2022 uh, in Plymouth Sound, but also in other places in the southwest, particularly in the Fowl, to investigate seagrass. Uh, so extensive survey sampling and, and also planting of Zostra marina beds in Plymouth Sound in 2022. So this is a photograph um, in Corsan Bay in Plymouth Sound. Uh, you can see a fairly sort of sparse seagrass bed. Uh, with feather duster worms, Sabella pavonina, with uh, snake locks and enemies, uh, Anemonia sulcata. Uh, but what has been going on, and this is a real summary because it's all work in progress, so there's not very much to report on the outcomes of these various studies um, until perhaps things are written up later this year. So there were sea search surveys, which I took part in, um, Corsan Bay, Drake's Island, Jenny Cliff, uh, those sorts of places in Plymouth Sound. Uh, very important citizen science project, um, identifying, collecting, uh, not collecting, identifying, um, looking at the abundance 
and looking at the condition of um, the Zostra marina subtitally. Uh, there was coring going on. Um, what you see in this picture of work being done by Imperial College and by the uh, Ocean Conservation Trust, uh, who are responsible for some of the replanting. Uh, this was percussion coring. You drive the core in about 70 centimetres and you get about a 50 centimetre core. But those of you who joined or, or have watched on the video, um, the work which is being done by Plymouth University, will see that they have been collecting cores of three metres worth of sediment and have begun to analyse those cores to demonstrate the amount of carbon at different depths in the sediment and the extent to which um, seagrass beds or at least the sediment in seagrass beds is storing carbon. A very, very popular topic at the moment, blue carbon. Um, I'm not convinced, and I will tell you this now, I'm not convinced that seagrass and sediments um, are in need of protection because although they do store blue carbon, though they do store car carbon, they do that anyway. Um, there we are. I'll wait for the um, vicious emails attacking me on that one. Uh, quadrat surveys. Yes, I was involved in that counting density, collecting seeds. Um, these are seeds on one of the um, uh, leaves of a seagrass and they very importantly go into this very interesting and relevant project which is being undertaken by the Ocean Conservation Trust to try and work out the sort of regime of lighting of using um, what sort of substratum for what sort of substrate for rearing seeds and so on and in the foreground here you've got coir mats you know rather like your doormat which seeds have been planted into together with some nutrients. Um, and that's the sort of thing which is being adjusted together with lighting regimes and so on. And those coir mats are then put out into the um, uh, environment of Jenny Cliff Cove, which is the area which is scheduled to try to restore or at least to build a new uh, Zostra marina bed. And this is one of the planted mats in, in Jenny Cliff uh, on the 28th of September 2022. Some growth. Not an enormous amount, but I think that if you look at the um, webinar from the um, Marine Protected Areas event, uh, you'll see much more up to date information uh, and show more success in terms of the uh, seedlings which are growing on these mats. So do look at, at Marine Protected Areas webinar. But there's another one, another species of Zostra. I hope you're all familiar with it. It's a species which grows at mid-tide level, it grows intertidally. Uh, and it's the dwarf seagrass, Zostra nultii. Um, and it's been expanding in the uh, Tamar, on the Tamar mudflats, since at least 2015. The areas covered by dwarf seagrass have expanded enormously. And Oliver Thomas at Plymouth University is documenting that change. He's using satellite and drone imagery uh, and uh, looking at nature and magnitude of ecosystem services, blue carbon and from macrobenthos. Uh, but all that's work in progress again. Uh, so this is underwater mid-tide level at West Mud, the Tamar Estuary on the 21st of September last year. Uh, and this is what um, the seagrass beds look like when you go out at low tide or even at mid-tide. Um, sometimes in the aerial images, it's difficult to tell the difference between seagrass and uh, seaweed, sea lettuce. I think the sea lettuce is a lot lighter colour. The seagrass is a lot darker, but very good work being done and very good, in, very encouraging that those seagrass beds are expanding in area. But perhaps the question is, why? What's happened? Is there anything to do with water quality? I'm not sure whether I, I think we've also seen um, a similar situation in the Fowl Ruin Estuary, which is called Wild Wildlife Trust, which is doing work. Um, seagrass beds, still work going on, still new finds being made. And Cornwall Wildlife Trust have also um, identified uh, a, a large um, Zostra marina bed in St. Austell Bay and will give full results of that uh, when they have a meeting in early April. 
So non-native species, another topic, any new arrivals or increased abundance or range extensions? Well, John Bishop, who um, keeps a very close eye on what's happening with non-native species, um, uh, John um, works at the uh, Marine Biological Association and no non-native species reported in the Southwest in 2022. You tell us if you think any different. But very peculiarly, Matt Slater sent me this image of the Red Ripple Briar Zone, which I showed you on rock and said it occurs under overhangs in shaded places, under boulders and so on. And here it is attached to Zostra marina leaves. So I hope that's not going to be a continuing thing because it won't do any good at all to a much valued um, species in terms of uh, seagrass. Um, one which isn't necessarily 2022. This picture was taken in 2022. It's the Australian barnacle Amphibalanus improvisus. But it used to occur in the Tamar. It hasn't been recorded there for many, many, many years. But Mike Poulston and other people in the Shores of South Devon group have been finding it um, around the Tin Estuary and also in the Dart. So it's quite a distinctive species. Always take photographs, please, please, please. If you're going to submit a record of something unusual, accompany it with a photograph. Um, otherwise, your record may not be validated. So there's a photograph of Balanus improvisus. Um, and again, shores of South Devon doing good work, mostly in the Tin and Torbay area, and uh, reporting uh, a higher abundance. These are not new records, but they're higher abundances of um, devil's tongue seaweed, Gratilupia turuturu, wakami, Undaria pinnatifida, and uh, the uh, Ascidian corellia, corella umiota. So look out for increased abundances of non-native species, but also, of course, range extensions. Now, new kids on the block. Every year we'll get some species which have not been recorded before in British waters um, or which have been rarely recorded in British waters uh, or have only been recorded in a particular part of um, southwest England for the first time. So you've got this spectacular sea slug, uh, Babakina and Donai, reported by Alan Murray in late August in the Isles of Scilly and, at, and later at Penzance. Um, you can't possibly miss it and you can't possibly mistake it for anything else same time always take photographs uh, this very very um, difficult to see uh, species carambi testudinaria in a rock pool at Trivone. we need people with sharp eyes i'm not sure i would have seen that uh, but charlotte coming saw it and photographed it and uh, that's a new record for britain uh, Discodorus rosei at Stoke Point, not a new record for Britain. There are previous records, but it was found at Stoke Point and at Lundy in 2022. And again, a rather spectacular, easy to identify photograph, but uh, uh, sorry, species, but do take photographs. Um, I think somebody mentioned that they might have seen Babakina a long time ago in Bobby Sand Harbour, but sorry, if you haven't got a photograph, um, your record will not be uh, accepted. Um, so I, I think that that's a bit of a threat, really. Uh, but sea slugs are notorious for appearances and then disappearances on decadal time scales. But they're rather nice, aren't they? Uh, increased abundance range of recent species. Well, last year I made quite a um, quite a spectacle of myself, I suppose, by getting all excited about finding a Mediterranean feather duster worm, Sabella spallanzanii, um, in Plymouth Sound. It had also been found by John Bishop and Christine Wood in um, Gosport Marina, uh, but we've find, been finding more uh, during uh, 2022 and also 2023. Uh, we can now uh, find five at Firestone Bay, and I found two, but in 2023, uh, in what we call Barn Pool, which is the Mount Edgecombe shore. So they're there, they're surviving the winter. Uh, they're a warm water species. Um, have they come across just by tidal, sorry, just by currents? 
or have they been helped by human uh, movement of ships and so on? Uh, Paul Naylor does very good work with um, uh, fish behavior in particular. And last year we identified, um, I haven't put a name on it, have I? <laughs> uh, this particular uh, Stevens Goby, I haven't put a scientific name on, but uh, Stevens Goby in uh, Plymouth Sound, but uh, during 2022, it had eggs. So not only is it um, an unusual species to find in shallow water areas, but it's also breeding. Uh, my contacts in uh, Tor Bay, um, particularly Terry Griffiths, tell me that um, the rather attractive um, anemone prawns, uh, Periclymenes, uh, have both increased in abundance and they're present all the year round. So even at this time of year, they're showing themselves. They used to disappear during the winter. So again, another warm water species, which is actually doing very well. Uh, increased abundance and range extension of recent species. Uh, this is St. Piran's crab. I know Steve Hawkins doesn't like it being called St. Piran's crab because it's found in Devon, but I'm quite happy to call it St. Piran's crab, all sorts of reasons why. So St. Piran's crab um, has extended its distribution. It's now known as far east as Prawl Point on the South Devon coast. And it seems to be increasing in abundance and it seems to be most likely breeding on a local basis and not relying on a recruitment from across the channel. So um, a, a species to look out for, it tends to be very localized in distribution. Don't assume that it's going to be everywhere in um, you know, semi-sheltered shores in amongst rock pools, but it does like dog, dog whale uh, shells. Notable events. Something I want to mention here, because it's the way that you can actually find out about the reproductive biology and about information which informs conservation from the most peculiar sources. So my diving club, Plymouth Sound Divers, has got a lot of members who go out diving the deep wrecks. So they go a long way offshore over areas which are flat sediment and drop onto a lump of metal. And on that lump of metal, most of those distant lump of, lumps of metal have pink sea fans. Now we worried, and I've already told you about the worry at Lundy about pink sea fans, um, about this species, which is a, a species protected on the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So it's something which people in the statutory nature conservation bodies pay particular attention to. Well, by finding decent colonies like this on these offshore wrecks, we're beginning to tell that the larvae must be able to go quite a distance. I always thought that the larvae, um, cannulae larvae, which are what they call less ethotrophic, in other words, they rely on the um, yolk sac in the larva. They don't feed on the plankton. Um, they just rely on surviving on what their parents give them in the way of nutrition. And so I rather thought they didn't go very far and they probably plonk down quite close to their parents. And um, here they are going five nautical miles, 10 kilometers away from the Dodman Point reefs over areas which are sediment. Now there might be some reefs out there which act as stepping stones, but I think that's quite important information for conservation, that the larvae can travel quite a distance. Now, I mentioned a lesser the trophic larvae, which relies on its yolk and, and what parents give it in the way of nutrition. You'll also see scattered all over this wreck, these thumbnail, sorry, uh, these, these tiny um, Devonshire cup corals. So they're about the size of your um, little, sorry, your thumb, thumbnail, those are about the size of your thumbnail. And um, they have a planktotrophic larvae. So that larva stays in the plankton for about a month and it feeds on plankton. So that can go a terrific difference distance with currents. Um, so you need to know about larval biology before you start trying to assess the likelihood of recovery um, of, of various species. So it's not all change. Um, oh, sorry, that's... I've just done that, so I can't really go back what I can. Um, it's not all change. 
And I think that it's very important not just to look for new things, not just look for range extensions, but to report persistence or constancy. And it's an important message for conservation advisors because conservation advisors quite often adopt and adapt from terrestrial paradigms. Um, now that always used to be a motto when I worked for the Nature Conservancy Council, and to an extent it works, but to an extent it doesn't work. And I think that a great deal, many of the mistakes which are being made in um, identifying marine protected areas and in identifying management measures for marine protected areas come from that adoption of terrestrial paradigms. Um, so there we are, more hate mail expected. But marine is different. More often than not, you go back to the same locations and that rare, unusual species that was first reported, where that was first reported, and you'll find whatever it is. You'll find them. And perhaps you've seen this example that I give quite frequently, but I revisited this site in 2022 at Sandway Point uh, in Corsan Bay. And you'll see that there's a sort of vertical wall here, which is studded with these lovely little um, orange and yellow um, scarlet and gold star corals. So that's the photograph I took in October 2022. Use the Plymouth Marine Fauna. The Plymouth Marine Fauna is a fantastic resource for looking at what's been recorded in the past, for looking at where it was found, how much of it was found, when it reproduces, whether it has a, a sort of uh, continuous presence or whether it is a sporadic occurrence and so on. The Plymouth Marine Fauna, which I haven't put a, up a link to, it's on the MBA website forward slash PMF. So looking back for the Plymouth Marine Fauna, you can find, here's a quote, a colony found while shore collecting at Soundway Point on the vertical sides of a small cave, originally found by WS in May 1906. <sighs> My picture from October 2022 is in exactly that location. It just shows that persistence occurs and that you can go back to exactly the same pace. It contradicts the view that many people in the such nature conservation bodies have that you cannot use old data because it's bound no longer to be correct. Here's another one. Again, I've mentioned this before, but these are pictures I took in February 2022. And it, there are two species here. One is Zostra marina. We've got so little information about where Zostra marina eelgrass used to be in Plymouth Sound or in the Fal or wherever, uh, that it's very frustrating because we don't know the extent to which it's been lost and where it's been lost from. But here at Maripool in Batten Bay in Plymouth Sound, um, the local area distribution, very restricted, patches of sand covered with Zostra. So there's your patches of sand covered with Zostra, and that paper was written in 1904. But what Andy Mackey and John Bishop were actually looking for was this worm, which again was a record uh, species new to science in 1902-03, published in 1904, and it was still there. It was still in the sediment, in amongst those patches of seagrass in Maripool, Batten Bay. The lesson here endeth. Notable species, what a fantastic picture, um, showing the double row of suckers on this common octopus. Of course, it's common in the Mediterranean, but again, go back to your literature, go back to the Plymouth Marine Fauna, because um, there's a particular paper uh, in 1954, uh, which indicates that these common octopus pop up every so often. Um, that they, they were very common in 1899 to the extent that fishermen had to pull in their pots because they weren't worth putting out because the octopus were taking all of the crustaceans which the pots were catching. And they were common again in 1950. So that's where this 70 years ago would refer to in the Guardian newspaper article, um, which also quotes that in one day in early June, Chesterfield says he caught 260 kilos of octopus, 150 individuals. In a typical year, we would expect to catch half a dozen. 
Uh, we've got individuals reported from Babacombe Harbour and Plymouth Sound. Let me know if you've got any other records. But um, there's something going on here, and I'll come back to this in relation to cephalopods. But um, octopus have been very abundant in the area of the fowl and West Cornwall in general, but not particularly further east. So it seems as if they've targeted um, that area uh, around about uh, South Cornwall and to the uh, to the west, to the west of the lizard. Uh, but we haven't been so lucky, or the fishermen would say that they have been lucky uh, because once those octopus go into the pots, then um, they can devastate uh, the catch. Uh, this one was actually called Stumpy because he was being caught every week. He was being caught in, in the fowl and uh, he had a couple of uh, losses of his arms, his tentacles. And a lot of the males were like that, apparently, in the early years, probably been fighting. Now, <clears throat> here's an interesting picture. Another, you know, another um, acknowledgement of people out there who've got sharp eyes. Now, I wonder if you've got sharp eyes. Now, these days, because I got a new version of PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint will offer me a caption for that image. And the caption would probably be broken plate with barnacles on. Well, it's not just a broken plate with barnacles on. I hope you've spotted it already. Take the plate away and there's a common octopus. Common octopus has pulled that plate up as camouflage. So, you know, I hope your eyes are sharp. Um, I think Mike Etheridge thought that that octopus had eggs. Now, one thing I want to know is whether you out there on the seashore diving have actually seen any common octopus protecting eggs. So have you seen any common octopus? I'd be del delighted to hear from you. And have you seen any eggs? But also, common octopus, warm water species, you'll all shout, global warming, climate change. Well, this is a cold water species, Elodony serosa, the curled octopus. And there've been loads of these in the fowl in particular, but in more in Cornwall in general, not to the east, not in Plymouth Sound, etc. But this is a cold water species, which is not only hanging on in there, but it's present on virtually every dive that people go on in uh, Falmouth Harbour, for instance. So a bit of a sort of, is it really climate change? Is it warming? Why have we got an increased abundance of a cold water species? And lots of people reporting aggregations of young cuttlefish in the late summer. This is in Plymouth Sound. Uh, there are 14 altogether in, in this picture, uh, taken as a video clip by uh, Steve Porter. Um, I'm told that it's not that unusual, but I do think that the reports that I was getting, the divers that were seeing these thought that it was very unusual. These are the 2022 uh, recruitment um, and why they're gathering together, I don't know, but presumably they're off to overwinter somewhere. Uh, and then perhaps something you might expect is a pink cuttlefish. These are deeper water species. Uh, and this was after uh, some of the um, February storms that swept in. Uh, and this is Constance Morris, who found this pink cuttlefish uh, on the shore at Marazion. Uh, so look out for these sorts of washouts, or wash ups. But I do ask the question, you know, I've, I've presented you quite a few unusual events with regard to cephalopods. And I do ask, is there anything going on with cephalopods at the moment? Notable events, washouts, wash-ups or wash-ups and wash-outs. Uh, we all see this from time to time. Uh, we see pallets, we see um, tree trunks and so on, swept up on the seashore with goose barnacles on there. So what I really want you to look out for, because yes, it's worth recording the goose barnacles, and identifying which species there are, take photographs is look out for Columbus crabs. Pick through the goose barnacles. These are Columbus crabs which come across probably from the Caribbean. They were 
they're called Columbus crabs because it's believed that Christopher Columbus actually described them in his logbook when he was um, venturing into the Caribbean. And uh, these are species which are swept across uh, the Atlantic and which turn up on our shores. But you've got to dig quite deeply into the um, stalk barnacles. But also uh, in terms of the Isles of Scilly finds, they were also finding uh, red hamburger beans and other things like violet seashells and so on. So all worth reporting, but something that seems to happen somewhere every year. But what is normal? Now, this is a sort of washout which might hit the press. It must be pollution. It must be all that sewage going into the sea. It must be something else which human activities have done. Well, this is at Goodrington on the 18th of May, um, Shores of South Devon group again. I wonder whether this was the collapse of the Pheocystis, the uh, Maywater bloom, which meant the seawater, uh, sorry, the seabed was smothered and deoxygenation occurred. Uh, Echinocardium, the um, sea potato here, is very well known for being sensitive to pollution, whether that's oil or whether it's pesticides or, or whatever. So I think this is a washout from the sediment dwelling species, uh, which was brought about as a result of deoxygenation. And I think that's likely normal. A big letdown for someone in the press who wants to have a tale of death and disaster and human abuse of the marine environment. Spiny lobsters, we've been telling this story for many years now. Uh, this is a picture on the 24th of August, 2022. And a lot of divers are reporting aggregations of spiny lobsters an aggregation and then the same sort of habitat you know in their drift dive or whatever without very many spiny lobsters certainly not in this aggregation now i actually counted 14 along this uh, rock face at the muse stone not a very good picture but it tells the story um there are other stories to tell as well as well this is really for the management webinar but this was a stall at the Plymouth Seafood Festival, bottom left here. And I not only believe that that was an undersized spiny lobster which was being sold, I actually spoke to the stall holder and said, that's, that's undersized, that spiny lobster. <laughs> and jokingly said, oh, yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. And I wasn't quick enough to take pictures of him, his stall. Um, he, did, he did tell myself and the person I was with the name of his company, which turns up nothing on a web search. So I do wonder what's going on here, whether uh, some folks are selling undersized lobsters for spiny lobsters. A uh, few buried lobsters again in 2022, but only a few. I'm not sure whether my next clip. Um, so yes, another point which Matt Slater tells me is that divers seem to be seeing less Palinurus elephas, the spiny lobster of Cornwall than in previous years possibly due to fishing pressure with a large increase in landings and an increase in the use of tangle nets to target them. So are the fishermen heading for another boom and bust? They do that brilliantly. Well, there are, other, there are some areas in Devon where taking spiny lobsters is prohibited. Um, I think that, you know, again, this is a management issue. This is a different webinar in a way. But uh, that is, um, you know, an alarming story that um, there seemed to be a reducing number of this species, which would disappeared in the late 1960s and early 70s because of overfishing. And coming up towards the end now, um, this is just a little bit of amusement, really. Don't forget the kelp forests. There's no change. They're still there. They're still storing carbon. But they always do, and there's no way of uh, increasing that. But on the 30th of August, an important marine forest off Plymouth is being designated uh, to the Queen to mark her platinum jubilee. Good o. And, and they're quite right to say that kelp forests are some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, kelp is also thought to help regulate the atmosphere by absorbing carbon dioxide. Well, they're there. They're always going to be there, I think. Um, and here we are at the Shagstone at the entrance to um, Plymouth Sound. So just a little bit of a, a sort of sideline. So this is my, these are my conclusions. 
I, I've tried hard to work out whether what we've seen on the seashore and seabed during 22, 2022 actually tells us anything about the state of Southwest seas. And this is what I'd say. I would say we've recorded the usual range of events such as washouts of species and occurrence of oceanic species. So nothing unusual, not a, a, an unusual year. Many observations of persistence um, and I think persistence is a good sign. In other words, they're still there. We haven't knocked them out of existence, but difficult to know comparable abundances. Very often you get records in things like the Plymouth Marine Fauna, which say that something occurs in a particular place, but you don't know how much of it. Uh, the zoologists are very good at recording uh, all sorts of information about uh, occurrence, about numbers sometimes, about times of reproduction and so on. Botanists, absolutely awful. If you look at the checklist of algae recorded from Devon, it's just a checklist. They're just, it's, they're twitchers. And again, I'm inviting more hate mail now, but, um, you know, we really need to do better when we record how much we're seeing um, of all the species as best as we can. But seabed marine life at Lundy continues to be in poor condition. I've only mentioned sunset cup corals but some other answer zones, such as red sea fingers um, and such as the um, yellow trumpet anemones, seem to have declined. So there's a negative assessment for Britain's first marine nature reserve, Britain's first no, eight, no take zone. Um, and we'd very much like to work out why. Probably not that we can do much about it. Survey of lobster numbers at Lundy show higher numbers in the no-take zone, so it proves again that highly protected marine areas can add value to commercial uh, fish stocks. Crawfish numbers remain high, uh, recovery of a previously overfished species maintained. Well, I actually wrote that before I read Matt Slater's email, um, which said that, that it's not being maintained perhaps in, in Cornwall because the fishermen have um, really gone for them more hate mail. Work to assess the status and potential for carbon capture and storage and trial planting schemes was extensive. I, I think it's all very worthwhile work. And having seen the uh, Marine Protected Areas webinar, there are obviously some really useful, really interesting results uh, coming out, but really that's for 2023. Uh, no additional to uh, Britain non-native species reported but some are becoming more widespread. It's always a negative assessment to do with non-native species, but I think particularly so with, with, with things like water cypora, uh, wakami. So um, no significant likely become established arrivals of warmer water species, but some increase or maintenance of abundance of those already here. So those couple of sea slugs, sea slugs come and go like nobody's business. Um, and every year there seems to be some returnee or some new record for Britain and so on. So I think no significant change in occurrence of warm water species since 2022. But obviously we're delighted that there are some which seem to become established, those which are range extensions, they're native to the Northeast Atlantic. Large numbers of common octopus, mainly in Cornwall in early summer and of juvenile cuttlefish in late summer, may suggest a change in those cephalopod abundances and behaviours, but cephalopods seem to be doing well. So your ideas on that, welcome. I just wanted to mention that what happens to your data, what happens to your information? Um, well, there are all sorts of um, schemes for recording data. Um, sea Search, for instance, has its own recording scheme. Porcupine Marine Natural History Society have their own recording scheme. Uh, obviously, there are professional surveys uh, submitting records, but all of these records get brought together and the data archive for marine species and habitats at the Marine Biological Association is a key player in all of that. Um, they also accept your observation, your information, your requests for advice, including photographs saying, can you tell me what this is? So you can contact the DASH team. I've put the um, email address there um you know send in your images ask questions but anything that goes to dash um will go into all these other different uh platforms um, and organizations 
Um, I'm told this isn't quite the right flow chart, but it's the one that I've got. Um, so I record very important and iNaturalist is a really good app on your phone to identify intertidal species in particular. Never worked at Lundy because there's no signal on the shore there. Um, and then things go into the National Biodiversity Network once they've been validated. Validation is very important. And then there are these other uh, organizations which are collecting and ex extract, uh, sorry, and maintaining um, information. So the Marine Biological Association plays a key role in ensuring that uh, data and data sets are properly archived and made available on these platforms. And now for the requests, what have you seen? Let me know. You can see my email address at the bottom there. And what's your interpretation of what you've seen? And what do they tell us about the state of Southwest Marine ecosystems? Do you consider 2022 to have been a normal year or are any events not normal? Do you have any significant, in other words, telling images, washouts, particularly a high abundance of unusual species and so on? Um, and that's all needed for the seashore and seabed section of the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Annual Report. And we'll be having our conference in April. And then after that, I will in earnest uh, be making sure that the editors of different chapters uh, complete um, a written report of, of what they're saying in these webinars and of any additional information that you send. So this is the final slide. Keep up to date. Um, sign up if you haven't already signed up to be kept up to date and catch up by going onto the website and clicking on that button uh, to see the webinars. A nice sunset view of my hometown, Ilfra Coombe. Thank you and keep posting your observations. Excellent, thank you very much, Keith. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, now is the time to pop those uh, in the Q&A or to use the raise your hand icon don't raise your actual hand because we can't see you. Um, and then we can unmute you and you can you can talk to Keith. Um, are you in while people type their questions in Keith, are you ready to take all one of our first questions? Oh, yes. I'm always uh, open to those. <laughs> I can't so, answer them, maybe. <laughs> well, Blaze Bullymore has said, uh, Keith, I share your being unconvinced about the overhyped capacity for carbon sequestration. Uh, as opposed to capture and storage by seagrass beds, but I wasn't clear by exactly what the point was that you were attempting to make, which you expected to invite hate mail. Can you explain <laughs> or expand, please? Um, I am. I see a lot of reference to blue carbon in government initiatives, and that includes especially the. Scottish government's um, consultation on highly protected marine areas in Scottish waters. It's top of the list. You know, it's basically supposed to be a benefit of um, highly protected marine areas. I just don't see how. Obviously, if you like to call it it, you can call it greenwash, but it occurs in a lot of um, applications for funds. So a lot of companies want to get carbon credits. And if they're supporting a project, which is said to improve the prospects for storing carbon uh, in the marine environment, uh, then they might well um, get credit for that. But I think that it's yet to be shown to be correct, to be true. And so my concern is that as scientists, we need to get the story right before we start using it um, in our various initiatives, either for marine protected areas or for funding. Blaze or doubtless come back to me on that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we haven't got any other questions at this stage. We've got a few uh a few comments, lots of comments saying thank you very much in the chat. Um, Keith, but we've got a slightly longer comment. Uh oh, Blaze has come back. I'm right with you, Keith. Thank you, Blaze. I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Uh, we've got a slightly longer 
comment from Jay Boyle, uh, which I'll read out for you. Uh, so great to see the seagrass expansion slide in the Tamar. I've noticed the beds boom in St. John's Lake, which was always blanket covered in green algae before. I'd hypothesize the water quality is playing a huge role in this, which makes me think should in terms of restoration projects, we'd be focusing more on improving environmental conditions, i.e. water quality before we actively intervene. Under the correct conditions, nature will thrive, question mark. Uh, improved water quality will have much wider benefits too. Well, I think that I'll, um, you know, see whether the people giving the management webinar have got anything to say, because we're seeing so much about uh, sewage pollution in the estuaries these days, uh, or going into rivers. It does seem as if um, the amount of raw sewage being put into our rivers and into our estuaries is increasing. But perhaps there's something other than sewage which might be harming um, intertidal and, and subtidal marine life. I mean, I think that in a lot of Plymouth Sound and estuaries, you'll find the same things in the same places as are being found 120 years ago. But even then, of course, the Tamar was polluted. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know how to do the sort of forensic work to try and identify what might have improved if anything is driving that increase in uh, seagrass beds other than the usual um, sort of, you know, you do have years with, with, with fruit, for instance, you have mast years when, you know, the apple trees, the pear trees did absolutely marvelously. And then for the next five years, you just get a normal crop. Now, do we have mast years equivalent in the sea that for no obvious reason, uh, things take off um, rather like the spiny lobsters. And then if they're not interfered with, they'll do very well for a few years and then they might die back again. This is decadal scale variation. And it's something which we've got plenty of examples of. We're not short of examples, but the reason why is the difficulty, I think. And, um, you know, the more people who look forensically and, and, and look for reasons, um, the better, but I, you know, there might there might well be a water quality issue in the increase in uh, intertidal seagrass beds in Plymouth Sound. We're watching this space with regard to uh, seagrass in the subtitle because now we've got good information, good baseline information, and I think we ought to be uh, looking out, perhaps even for some recovery in the subtital seagrass. I've got one more comment for you, Keith. Um, no more questions at the minute. If anyone wants to get a last question in, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, but Michael Poulston has said that Xanthohydrophilus is doing very well indeed at sites around Torbay and Plymouth last year and this year so far. Uh, thank you, Mike. Yes, you've reminded me, you told me that and I never put it into the presentation, but um, I will make sure that it goes into the uh, annual report. Excellent, excellent. Well, if there's no more questions, then um, have you got any final comments, Keith, that you would like to make before we close? Well, thank you again to the NBA for, for hosting this. And thank you for all those people who've innocently posted their interesting finds on Facebook or whatever. And then I've gone and harvested them. Now, I think I've got permission for all of the images which I've used. If I haven't, I'm very sorry. Get in contact with me because getting permission to use images in these presentations and in the annual report uh, is important. Um, so keep on looking, keep on finding interesting things, keep on thinking why, keep on thinking, does it matter? Um, and, and, and do keep in touch. Thanks very much everyone for watching. Excellent, thank you very much, Keith. Um, and just a little reminder uh, to everyone, that um, we've got some other uh, in this series coming up, some other webinars. Um, the next one is Fish and Reptiles by Douglas Henderson on the 29th of March. So um, please, uh, you'll get the details for that and come and join us again for that one, if that's of interest to you. Um, and also just a quick reminder, check out the, the website for the Marine Biological Association if you're interested in any of our upcoming uh, events. These change all the time and we add things to it all the time. So, so keep an eye. Um, and the best way also to be updated on stuff is uh, to be a member, um, to join the association, to be part of the gang and part of the community. Um, so 
I will leave you all with that. Um, and thank you for coming and joining us. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith.